Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. We've got another great show tonight. Uh, we've got Gordon Telefin here, and he's going to talk about photographing the eclipse and using his solar eclipse timer, uh, his timer app. Uh, but before we get to uh, Gordon's presentation, I did just want to point out a couple of things about the upcoming schedule. Uh, the first of which is that next week, there's no, we don't have a show. We're taking off next week uh, for the Super Bowl. So uh, no show next week. And then we'll be back on February 18th. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to, uh, to mention is the, uh, the TAIC workshop, which we've got scheduled for March 31st. Uh, and this time we've got, uh, we've got Eric's uh, M101 data uh, that he took from with his uh, monster telescope at, at the uh, uh, Sierra Remote Observatories, um, and so it's here on our on our website on the uh, the workshop page. You can get to it by uh, clicking this link here on the on the website, and it'll take you to the to the page where you can download the data. Um, and I would encourage everyone to uh, take a look at that data, download it, um, work it up. You know the most of us don't have that many opportunities to uh, to 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 photograph a, a galaxy with a 20 inch plane wave at a at a dark site with with amazing seeing like like they have out at the SRO uh, and uh, this one's even more fun because Eric was able to uh, go back and get some additional data with the supernova uh, so so that'll be that'll be really neat to uh, to see as well so let me stop this share here. And uh, so speaking of, uh, of uh, dark sites with amazing thing, uh, our guest, uh, you know, not next week, but uh, on the 18th is uh, Carlos. And Carlos is here tonight. Uh, and he's going to give us just a brief uh, overview of his of his presentation that's going to be coming up in two weeks. Uh, he's going to be talking about remote imaging at his site in Chile. Uh, so, uh, Carlos, are you uh, are you ready? Can you uh, come on and just give us a, a couple of minutes about your uh, your presentation? Uh -huh. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Cheers from greetings from Atacama, Chile. So, uh, thanks, guys. Next week, uh, well, the 18th, in about two weeks' time, I, uh, I will be presenting uh, my project of uh, remote and on site imaging from Chile. That's a remote uh, roll of roof observatory that I mostly built myself to make it affordable to amateur astronomers and and also uh, um, I have the facilities for people to come to do astrophotography from Latin America, Europe or the, the northern um, uh, North America. So that's what I'm going to be presenting. I uh, hope to see you there and here's guys until then. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. That should be really, really interesting. So, so that does bring us then to tonight's presentation. And as I mentioned, uh, Gordon Calipin is, is here and uh, he's going to talk about manual eclipse photography uh, and uh, his app, the Solar Eclipse Timer. So I've really been looking forward to this to this presentation and we're all getting really excited about, about the eclipse. And I know most of us uh, are, are hoping to see it, uh, or at least those of us that live in the in the U.S. do. So, um, and as we all know, there's a lot of different approaches to to photographing uh, eclipses, and some of them can get pretty complicated with uh, with camera control software and and detailed scripts and whatnot. Uh, but but Gordon's going to teach us uh, uh, maybe some simpler uh, ways to approach photographing the eclipse. So. Gordon, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you and you can start your presentation. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Let me uh, try to share. Uh-oh, let me... Uh... Sorry.
Sorry about that. Do you have it? Yes, we do. Yeah, looks good. Okay. So anyway, um, thank you everybody for inviting me to uh, be a guest on your show. I really appreciate it. Um, the talk tonight is going to be manual solar eclipse photography techniques and tips. And uh, just a little bit about I'm a board certified. Looks like we're having an issue with uh, with Gordon's speed, though. So unless it's just me, now. can the rest of you hear him? No. I can still see him, but no, I'm not. Same, same here. Uh, we don't have So this video is frozen. It looks like it might his his connection might be dropping. All okay, right, yeah. uh, telephone. Molly, we have Molly, telephone you, number, right? Molly, could you tell us a little bit about this um, app that he uses while Patrick calls up on the cell phone and sees what. We can yeah, do. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I always had to you know, I'm... we might have him back. <laughs> Is he back? Oh, he's back momentarily. Gordon, we lost your <laughs> audio. He's frozen. Yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, Let me give him a call and have him have him um, drop off the call and come back and see if that helps. Um, I can talk a bit in the meantime. Um. I can't, I can't shut off his screen though, so that's okay. Um, yeah, so the Solar Eclipse Timer app, I got to use it in 2017 and 2019 Enough as well. To remember. He's coming in and <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, we got to get a hold of him. Um, and uh, it announces when things are happening during the eclipse, which is great when everything is crazy and you're, um, it's hard to, focus on what's happening in the moment, but the app will speak to you and remind you, like, look for shadow bands and take off your uh, filters and stuff like that. And that's really helpful. Hello. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happened? Okay. All right. We'll see if it comes back here shortly. Um, ahead, yeah. So hope you He'll get into much more detail, um, but uh, I, now I used it to practice for uh, the precise timing that I had set up for my, when I used my DSLR for those two eclipses. And so then I was able to get the timing for the location I was going to be at, so I could get that timing really precise. And he's going to propose actually using it in another way where you uh, it's prompting you to take pictures live while you're there. Uh, if you're not able to or don't want to try and go through the trouble of um, trying to automate a script for yourself. So this is a way to be reminded to do things like change your uh, ISO and stuff like that for different things. Um, but it's an audio prompt. And uh, that way you can still enjoy the eclipse and also get pictures and be reminded of what's going on in the moment. Um, so that's what he's going to uh, go through as well when we get him back on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I found it. I put it like on a speaker, so then everybody around me was able to hear the announcements as well. It counts down to the final seconds and reminds you to put your eclipse glasses back on at the end, uh, so you don't get blinded after third contact. We having any luck? And it's been around. Yeah, he much. is. Uh, he's just working on getting getting back into the conference and getting this presentation back up on his machine. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Steve hopefully. mentions that he used yeah. it in 2017 and it worked for him really, really well. Yeah. Um, so that'll be good. Yeah, it's for Android and Apple. So uh, all of that covers most people of uh, uh, where the app is available. And he was just telling us actually that there's a Spanish language version available as well. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, I will definitely be using it for this upcoming eclipse as well. I got to download the update, I think, still. Um, but I, I still haven't finished coding my automated sequence yet. I'm going to use Nina this year instead of Backyard Nikon, but I've been very busy with my dissertation. Um, so I'm going to try and cram that in, but uh, the app will let me double check that the timings are going off correctly. Uh, since he's got it 
precisely timed for the location you're going to be at. And it's it's tied to when it's when the different um, events are calculated to happen, like second contact and so many seconds before and after second contact for things like diamond ring and shadow bands and things like that. It's pretty sophisticated for its um, uh, simpler looking interface. But uh, yeah. Um, well, well, sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, it's a live show and this occasionally happens. <laughs> Is there anything else we want to discuss? And uh, assuming Gordon's going to be back in here in a little bit. Uh, uh, I think go ahead. some of us are, are, are preparing for the upcoming eclipse. And the one thing that you always want to know is you don't want to spend your time fussing with a camera for your precious four minutes of the eclipse. You want to enjoy that. So any software or procedures or anything that, that helps you do that it is a benefit. That being said, there are still people which will fuss with cameras during that four minutes and then look up and the eclipse is gone. And it does it's all go over. Quickly. Uh, it looks like we might be getting. Uh, I think we got Gordon back. Gordon? Yeah, I think we're here. Let me see if I can get my presentation. Okay. Gordon, we can hear you, so you can have okay. your phone. Yeah, it might have just been that uh, your internet connection got a little bit uh, fuzzy. Yeah, I, I apologize for that, guys. Um, it happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now let me, I guess I got to go back to sharing the screen. Yeah. Entire screen. How's that? Yeah, that looks good. Looks and good. You can hit that hide button again as well. Okay. Uh, all right, are we better now? Yep, yeah, looks good. Okay, I apologize for that. Should we, I just start from? You just start beginning? over because you cut out pretty early. Okay. All right. Here we go. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to thank everybody for letting me uh, be a presenter on the show. And just again, um, a little bit about me. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon as my day job, but I've always had an interest in space and NASA and astronomy. And within my hobby of astronomy, I have a special interest in total solar eclipses. And the first then one that I went to was in Africa in 2001. Hey, Gordon, why don't you turn off your video just to conserve some and bandwidth? This one was in 2019. Let's see if we can get him back here. In Argentina. And the reason. Hey, Gordon, can you hear me? And I'm on. You can hear me go ahead and turn off your video uh that will help this save your bandwidth so today the the reason i have this wonderful opportunity to be i'm not sure that he's able well, to yeah, I I came across um sorry guys <laughs> oh, along the bottom you see where you've got the microphone and then the little camera turn off yeah. your camera okay i did it okay great okay now let's see if that gives you more um uh, communications and then this go back crazy. to I've the never, slide. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I've, never, I've never had a problem. Okay. Yeah, just a bad night sometimes. Are you still there? No, he's frozen. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, one other idea is um, if we can get a copy of his slides, one of us can share screen and then oh, he doesn't have to be pushing video at all. Just to get the full Yeah, that yeah. might work. Yeah, and then, then, we, then we can just... We seem to be frozen. Can you hear us? Gordon? Oh, God. Um... Can someone give him a call? Yeah, I'm going to call, call him back. back. Yeah, and yeah, just uh, if we can quickly see if we can send one of us slides, and then uh, we can push the slides, then he won't be pushing anything. 
and that might help. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this does happen on occasion on on live streams, like we mentioned. Uh, sometimes internet. Doesn't I'm trying to get to full. Sometimes it comes through in bits and pieces. <laughs> Green. Yeah, now. Yeah. All right. So hopefully we can get those slides pushed through, and uh, hopefully we can get them back on here shortly. Um, or, oh, sorry, you... everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we'll we'll do our best to get things up and running again. Give us a couple minutes. Hi. Uh, in the Does meantime, anybody else have any questions they want to uh, ask about the upcoming solar eclipse or comments or anything else? You've got that whole chat thing over there to chat about, so go for it. I could talk a little bit about how I used Backyard Nikon in the past to use my DSLR for the eclipse. Um, so Backyard Nikon and Backyard EOS are both apps that are for, I think, I, think, I can't remember if they're cross-platform or just for Windows but uh, they allow you to control your DSLR from your computer, which I used quite a lot for doing deep sky astrophotography. And it does have some sequencing capabilities. So you can uh, put in like, I want five pictures of this exposure time at this ISO and um, you, can, you can set a set up a series of those. And for the Eclipse, I needed specific, using a, a Fred Espinax website where he's actually got this really great table of uh, with, for certain for for a, an ISO value and for an F ratio, what exposure you should use for each of the different phenomena. So uh, looking at I can't remember what website I what website I looked at. Um, I think uh, Gordon's going to mention it here, but there's there's some websites where you can get the exact uh, timing like plus or minus of contact two or contact three um, of getting those timings, and then I wrote. Uh, sequence, but instead of doing it in the GUI, because that can get kind of clunky, I actually opened up the file, which is just a JSON file, which is just a text file, and copied and pasted the little um, code segments, but changed the values to be exactly what I wanted. And then uh, after measuring how long it took the camera on average to get to receive a command from the computer, which is about two and a half seconds, did some precise uh, timing of uh, how many exposures I could fit into each different exposure time for each of the different events. And I used the app quite extensively to make sure that all the timing synced up with what they should. And Backyard Nikon, Backyard EOS cost, uh, at least when I bought it, it was $50. I think it might still be the same. Uh, but I, it, lets, it ha lets you have a, a live view on your DSLR as well, which is really great for doing deep sky, planetary, things like that for focusing. I think Gordon is back. Okay. Uh, we restarted the computer. Are we able to get his slides so we can just push those? The presentation oh, yeah. is quite large, so I'd have okay. to go through a Dropbox or something to get it. Yeah, I'll take so a little He was hoping that re restarting would uh, kick the computer in the head and make it work. Okay. While we're doing that, um, I'm going to share my screen for a while. Is that okay? He's, he's sharing his screen right now. He's sharing his right now, Alex. Oh, okay. Um, Patrick, can you, yes. um, can you tell him that he may be muted? We don't hear him speaking if he's trying to. Meat, Meat doesn't think he's muted, so if unless it's his uh, local microphone setting. Yeah, because Meat, Meat thinks that he's on. Um, the other thing I would check, Gordon, is um, making sure that the right microphone is selected by clicking. Yeah, the do you have me now? Yeah, we got now? you. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to reboot my microphone when I yeah. rebooted the computer. I am so sorry, guys. Okay, it happens. We all curse technology on a regular yeah. basis. <laughs> all right. Um, you can go ahead and put that presentation full screen.
I think we've lost him again. <laughs> uh, his video appears to be frozen again. Um, it'll probably take a while if we oh. were, to, were to try and get his slides. Do we want to consider inviting him back? <laughs> Is my screen being shared now? Um, so we're seeing yes. Google Meet right now, yes. But what happens is every time you share the screen, then you start to freeze and we can't hear you. So it's something that's not Maybe, happening. Maybe um, stay out of full screen mode for PowerPoint okay. and just yeah, I can. do it uh, in this like presenter's mode and see if that makes a difference. But. Maybe not because he's freezing again. It's just you want me to wow. Yeah. You just do it like that. Um, I think we're still losing you, unfortunately. Yeah, he's cutting out. Yeah. Um. Well, we can either take a few minutes to see if we can get his slides sent like on drive or something, or we can consider uh, asking them back. And well, we, we got to do that before the eclipse, though. Is, we don't have any other free. Well, is if, Carlos... if, I can, if I can make a suggestion. Um, yes. Gordon, why don't you try not sharing your screen and just talk to us and let's see how that works. Um, we can try that. Um, I don't know why this is not working. Um, it's working right I, now. But it would be it would be terrible without. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, is is uh, next week's pre or two weeks from now, Carlos? You still out there? I know you've been in and out. Uh, yeah, it looks like Carlos is here. Carlos. Yes, I'm here, guys. Can um, can we nudge you aside and and let Gordon come back in your slot? Sure, no problem. Does that make sense to you? Because we've got to get him in before the eclipse, so he's like yesterday's <laughs> news. Yes, so, I can imagine that, yes. <laughs> with the permission of the 50 people who are out there being so patient, yes. would you mind coming back in a couple of weeks? Is that, um, good, with, is that good with everybody? I, I think that that makes the most sense, yeah. Am I not sharing now, guys? Really? You are. You are. Okay, because I mean, it looks good to me on my I end, think. and my mic is working. Okay, let's go ahead and try yeah, it then. Maybe it's maybe it'll just work now. Yeah. Let's give it okay. One okay. Let's yeah. Try. We'll give right. it one more try. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to take that hide off the bottom. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. Sure, yeah. that's fine. All right. Just Are you fine. seeing that slide? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start here. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. I am so sorry about that. Um, but anyway. So the reason I got invited back uh, was to cause all these problems. No, uh, it was because I came across Steve Zeigler's uh, presentation on his two experiences with total solar eclipse photography. And I watched it on YouTube and he did an excellent job. I mean, it was a really, really good talk. But I noticed, and he said it during his presentation that he was gearing up for that eclipse in 2017 is basically his first one. And he wanted to script it. So he had a lot of sophisticated gear. And my point was, is that's not your average setup for a mom and dad to go out to the eclipse and enjoy it. So I reached out to you and um, asked if I could present a simpler way to do eclipse photography. So I appreciate this, um, this uh, opportunity. So my eclipse photography journey starts in the spring of 2001 when I went to Zambia, Africa. And back then we we're using slide film. So that's my little bitty sit setup compared to what Steve had going in 2017. And back then everything was manual, manual. So you had to test your disc exposures. You had to keep notes and send those slides off. And when they came back after they were developed, you'd have to analyze them and choose your exposure. So these are my slides from 2001. And you can see on the upper left here, you would, you would um, take a roll of film with different shutter speeds of the sun and send that roll out. And then um, 
when it came back, you would look at them either on a light screen or with these battery powered um, viewers that we used to have or on a slide projector. And you would figure out what exposure you wanted for the partial phases. And then you would go to the eclipse and take your pictures and you wouldn't know what you had until you got the slides back from the developer. And you had a limited number of exposures too, because it was 36 images per roll. And then if you wanted to not use a slide projector for a presentation, you had to you know, digitally scan them and uh, to get them into PowerPoint. So during Steve's presentation, the other thing that caught my eye was he was nice enough to refer to my tools because I've been working on Eclipse stuff for a long time. But I've been inspired by a lot of great people. It's not just me. You know, Fred Espinick, Bill Kramer, Rick Feinberg, Jay Anderson, you know, just to name a few. And the work I've done to help people enjoy the eclipse in includes my app, Solar Eclipse Timer, includes this book that I wrote. And then, of course, uh, my YouTube channel, which has hours of eclipse educational material on it. And um, why I'm so passionate about this, and my obsession actually starts after the 2001 eclipse. Because back then we didn't have YouTube and we didn't have a lot of websites with information about um, eclipses. So you had to read everything to figure out what you were going to do. And I had written everything that Fred Espinick uh, had written. And I was prepared to go to this eclipse. I practiced at home. But when I got there, I was so overwhelmed by the experience that I was late going into C2. So this is my first picture at C2 and it's chromosphere. So I'm 20 minutes late. I've missed diamond ring, I've missed Bailey's beads. But then I got good corona shots and this was a three minute and 53 second eclipse. So my wife to be and I were there in this field in Africa enjoying the corona. And then all of a sudden the sky started getting bright. I mean, it was gonna be over. So I ran over to my gear and started to take pictures. And my first picture after C3 is diamond ring. So I missed um, chromosphere and Bailey's beads going, going in and coming out. So when I got back to the States, I realized that you can't time an eclipse with your watch. And I started to develop the first eclipse talking timer, which back then ran on Windows Pocket PC, and it was completely manual. And it also ran on Windows desktop. And remember, this is before phones. So back in 2002, there were things called personal digital assistants and Compact had one. And there was actually an app store for this. So this is the first app stores before Apple and Google. And I'd, I sold this app on these old app stores for, for Windows. But again, they were completely manual. But they were a talking timer. When you put in the contact times, it counted down to them audibly so you wouldn't miss the contact times. And I also started the concept of making announcements about the partial phase phenomena. But there was no geolocation. You had to figure out your contact times from the NASA Eclipse Bulletin and then enter them. So today I'm gonna, I wanna do some brief astronomy. I know you guys know where the path is and you know contact times. I'm not gonna spend time on that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the path. I do wanna talk about how we get local circumstances and then I really wanna spend a lot of time on um, photography. So I only have a few astronomy slides and I'm not gonna talk about the basics. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is you know, the moon and the earth are constantly making a shadow on the opposite side of the sun. And you can look at an eclipse as the earth getting in way, getting in the way of the umbra as it's passing by us. But the umbra is only just about as long as the distance from the moon to the earth. And as you know, that changes. So sometimes we don't get a total eclipse, but the moon is moving away from the earth at about 2.5 to three centimeters a year. So in about 650 million years from now, we won't have total eclipses. But the thing that I think is interesting is there'll be a few dozen million years where we will only have hybrid eclipses because the, the eclipse will be like the one that was just in Australia where it starts as an annular eclipse, but then the Earth's surface rises into the tip of the umbra you have a total eclipse for a little while, and then it goes back to an annual eclipse. So I think that's kind of interesting.
And then really simplifying the space perspective of eclipse generation is picture two interdigitated hula hoops. And the important thing about the hula hoops is where they intersect, that's called the node. And at the node on either side of it, there's about 12 degrees or about 32 to 34 days, it depends on what eclipse you're trying to worry about, where there's even the possibility that the umbra can hit the earth. So a moon crossing from the bottom to the top is called an ascending node eclipse. Those have odd Saros cycles names. Uh, numbers. So 2017 and 2024 are ascending eclipses. They're both odd. And moon, the moon crossing from the bottom to uh, from the top to the bottom is a descending node eclipse. And so this is the Saros series for 139. This is the uh, Saros that's giving us our April 8th eclipse right here. But you see, this Saros started in 1501, and it generated all of these partials and a few hy uh, hy hybrids, and now it's generating totals. It's generating our it's generating our April total, and it'll also generate a total in 2186. That's seven minutes and 29 seconds long, which is almost the maximum. So this sorrow cycle is spanning 1,262 years. The other thing that's interesting about the 2024 eclipse is that it crossed the 2017 eclipse, which are both from different sorrow cycles. And this is a pattern that has happened many, many years in the past and it'll happen many, many years in the future. And I wrote an article for AccuWeather, a blog article for this that discusses the kind of the nuance of this cross and what it means for the sorrow cycle. And um, Molly has the uh, hyperlink to that. Let's just look at the path. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the path. I know you guys know where it is. Um, the main thing is that this path is interesting in that it is over a four minute eclipse all the way into Indiana. And people who saw the 2017 eclipse are going to wanna to see another one. People who missed it heard what they missed. So they're gonna to wanna to see 24 and it'll have more hype. It crosses more populated areas. So a lot of people are gonna see this eclipse and a four minute eclipse that you don't have to travel to internationally is a big deal. And just, of course, you always have to talk a little bit about eye, eye safety. During the first partial phases, you wanna protect your eyes with solar glasses. During totality, you take your glasses off and you look at totality and the corona with your eyes and binoculars. And then after third contact, you protect your eyes and your gear again. And just the gear protection tip is, you know, you always put your solar filters on the front of the optics because you wanna prevent that energy from getting into the system. So a couple of things about the local circumstances. You know, we're spoiled nowadays because we have these interactive maps that we can tap where we want and get all the contact times. When I started chasing eclipses in 2001 and 2002, we had to mail a self-addressed stamped envelope to Fred Espinick at Goddard Space Flight Center, and he would mail back the eclipse bulletin for that particular eclipse. And everything was either in charts or paper maps, and you had to extrapolate your contact times. So there was some error. The one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about in terms of enjoying an eclipse is understanding the umbra path direction manually, again, back to manually knowing what to do during an eclipse. I know you guys know the contact times and the compass directions and the altitudes, but what I wanna talk about is the umbra approach and umbra exit direction because you have to do this manually. And the way you do it, you know, if any of these pop-ups that you get on the interactive maps has no information about the Umbra direction for your particular location. So the little trick is to get a clear compass and put it on your computer bezel with the top up so it's held square to north. And you're not worried about the compass working, you're just worried about dragging that interactive map under the center of the compass and then writing down these compass headings for the, the umbra uh, approaching you and the umbra exiting you. And the reason this is important is it changes along the path and it also changes for every eclipse you might go to. So to give you an example, 
if somebody is observing this eclipse on the border of Mexico and Texas, they're going to be looking at C2 at about 169 degrees on a compass heading. But the umbra is going to be approaching from their right side, from their right shoulder, 52 degrees to the right. So if they want to see the umbra darkening the sky as they're watching the eclipse in the sky, they have to look to their right. And after C3, if they want to see the umbra making the sky dark um, when it's leaving them, they have to look behind them over their left shoulder. But that's in Texas. Maine is completely different because it's later in the afternoon and the direction of the path has changed. So for Maine, they're looking at C2 almost in the same direction as they're looking at the umbra approaching. So it's really important to manually understand the umbra directions. Now, Steve, in his talk, um, talked a little bit about Xavier's um, uh, work with his interactive maps. I wanted to point out three things a, a little bit more closely. Steve talked a lot about this little red tick on this um, diagram that happens with this map. And that's important because you want to rotate your sensor to match the sun's equator. But another little hidden trick is this little LC right here. That little LC is not just a label for that column, it's a hyperlink. And when you click on it, you get Xavier's illustration or prediction for the Bailey's beads for that particular location. So that's very, very powerful. And the C1 through C4 and the max in these parentheses right here are not just labels, those are hyperlinks. If you click on those, you go to an external website called Peak Finder, and it gives you the elevation of the horizon for that time and that location. So it's very powerful to plan landscape eclipse shots. So going back to number one, we all know about the red tick. What you want to do is use that to get that angle. So you angle your sensor to match the um, equator of the sun. Now, this is going to be a, an eclipse during solar maximum, and they are generally more symmetrical. So you might not have to worry about long streamers only in the axis of the equator. But it's still important to do this because if you want to match your pictures to the predicted Bailey's beads, you have to have this orientation right. So these are my beads pictures from 2019 matched to the prediction. And then if you're trying to do a sequence shot that has landscape that's going to be impacted by it, using Peak Finder can help you predict that. So Peak Finder showed me the exact contour of the Andes Mountains that this eclipse was going to set in. So when I got to the site, I knew where to point. Let's briefly talk about weather. So everybody's seen some variation of this map and I've just labeled it with best, fair, and risky to make it more clear. These are Jay Anderson's data where he uses historical data to predict um, the, pr the risk of having cloud cover. And of course, Mexico in the blue here has the least risk the very southwestern part of Texas has less risk. The middle of the country is fair, about 50-50. And when you get to the north, it gets more risky. And you can look at it in terms of this graph with cities. This is the 50% mark where the red arrow is. And you see the cities in Mexico are way low. And when you get up to the northeast, it starts getting high. The problem with this April eclipse is a lot of the weather patterns in the United States have this direction of a long drawn out front that is moves from the southwest to the northeast. And you can see the shape of those fronts matches the shape of the path a lot. So we, if we have a bad eclipse day, we are at risk for having hundreds of miles of the path being under one of those fronts. One of my other specialties before I get into photography is studying the science of the partial phase phenomena. And these are fascinating because the moon is becoming a dimmer switch to all of the electromagnetic energy that's coming from the sun. And some of these phenomena are unique to eclipses. And we're photographers, and you can document some of these with photography, and it's fun to do. 
So a clip chase, uh, uh, temperature changes would be an observation. Taking pictures of pinhole images, projection images, is something you can photograph. Sharp and fuzzy shadows you will photograph. An eclipse breeze is an observation. Taking pictures of the dissipation of convective clouds is something you can photograph. Animal behavior is an observation. Ambient lighting is an observation, sometimes photogra photography. And shadow bands is video. And my book, I've written the most that anybody else has written about the science of the partial phase phenomena. So if this interests you, I have the information out there. So temperature dropping, you're gonna feel the temperature drop. A typical eclipse uh, in North America would probably drop about eight to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. You can expect that. In South America, we had amazing conditions to have a big drop. I documented a 26 degree uh, decrease in the Fahrenheit temperature. This is a great thing for students or kids to do. Have them graph the temperature versus time and just use a liquid thermometer and have them take readings every five minutes and plot it. Pinhole projection, this is the concept of camera obscura where images through a pinhole get projected upside down and reversed left to right. So you can take pictures of the crescents through a Ritz cracker or the natural pinholes that get created by the leaves in a tree. You can um, stamp out holes in a piece of paper and write your name or the date of the eclipse or whatever. And when you take those pictures uh, before totality, the crescents will be pointing one way opposite of what's in the sky. And after totality, they will flip because they're gonna be opposite what's in the sky again. And of course you can make a pinhole projection box with a little pinhole in tinfoil at one side and a viewing area on the other side. The partial phase phenomena are amazing. You're gonna see, I mean, the partial phase phenomena are of sharp and fuzzy shadows is amazing. You're gonna see pictures before this eclipse and after this eclipse with people taking pictures of their hands and saying my, my shadows look weird or my shadows were odd and they don't exactly know what's going on, but what's going on is after about a 50% eclipse, the crescent in the sky is sending light rays to the earth that are more linear when they are in line with the crescent. But when the crescent, when you create a shadow that's perpendicular to the crescent, the crescent is, is behaving as an extended source of light again now. So it creates an umbra and a penumbra. So if you see pictures of hands on the internet, any part of the edge that's sharp is because it's in line with the crescent above them. And any part of the picture that's fuzzy is because it was 90 degrees to the crescent behind them. A mysterious eclipse breeze is the hardest partial phase phenomena to witness because you have to have perfect conditions. You have to be on a day where there's not a lot of regular wind from just the weather. And then you have to be located in a field that has some hills around it in the direction of umbra approach. Because what happens is as the air, as the ground cools because the umbra is deepening, the ground in these valleys will cool and that cool air will coalesce and it'll roll down those valleys and it'll hit you as a cool breeze in your observing area from the direction of umbra approach. Now this could be a little different than the way you're looking to observe the eclipse, so you have to be aware of it. But remember, eclipse breeze is not a wind. If it's windy conditions, you're not gonna be able to perceive this. Another thermodynamic effect of eclipses is the dissipation of convective clouds. So on a normal summer day, if you wake up in the morning and, um, and the, the sky is clear, and then around lunchtime, there's these white fluffy clouds in the sky, that's because the sun is um, providing radiant energy to the ground, which is then creating warm thermals that rise up to the boundary layer and condense and make these fluffy clouds. Well, what happens in an eclipse is the moon is shutting off this energy to the ground and these warm thermals start to slow down and they start to bring less moisture to these convective clouds. And these convective clouds are reliant on this persistent supply of moisture. So about 10 or 15 minutes before totality, 
the these convective clouds will dissipate they'll evaporate because they're not supplied with the moisture i sh i saw it in 2017 and it's amazing now we're not talking about big rain clouds with gray bottoms those will not dissipate but little convective clouds will animal behavior changes during an eclipse we're humans and we know an eclipse is happening we're watching it we know it's going to get dark the lux is going to go down very slowly over an hour and a half but the animals think nighttime is coming. So crickets will start chirping about 10 or 15 minutes before totality. You might see a small flock of birds flying in a direction that looks like they have purpose. That's not probably random. That's probably an animal behavior where they're flying to their nighttime position. Bees stop flying during totality or when it starts to get dark they try to get back to the hive because they use the sun to navigate that was studied a lot in 2017. the changes in ambient lighting are amazing at an eclipse is if anybody has been to an eclipse and they have recognized that in the last five minutes before the for c2 their surroundings go to this gray bland less distinct color look like you've put on a set of gray sunglasses that has to do with something called the Purkinje effect the Purkinje effect happens when the lux in your observing area is going down to the point where the cones in your retina that do your color vision do not have enough photons to fire effectively and it's getting dark enough that your rods, which are your nighttime vision cells, but only absorb in one wavelength, start to kick in. So what happens is the colors become muted and bland when you're in this area of vision called the mesopic zone, and that's called the Purkinje effect. One of the things I'm telling people to do this year, because I've realized the difference between my 2017 and 2019 eclipse, there's not gonna be a lot of foliage around um, the, the path in some parts of this country. And a lot of people are going to be wearing dark kind of winter cold clothes. To see the Purkinje effect, you need target colors. You have to have a lot of reds and greens in your observing area. So I'm telling people to tell all their friends to wear bright colors to the eclipse so you have target for your eyes to see the Purkinje effect. And then the final partial phase phenomena that's interesting is in the last 90 seconds or 120 seconds before the eclipse, this little slit of light now comes through the atmosphere as a slit lamp and it gets perturbed by some layer in the atmosphere. And it's either refraction because it's going through cold and warm layers of the atmosphere or it's some wave um, um, positive or negative adding effect creates these little gray shadows on the ground that are really exciting to see. They're always in ro rows. They're very low contrast. The rows can move to left or to the right. And sometimes the shadows look like they're skipping in between. Now I'm going to start on photography. This is pretty detailed, but everything that I have in here is in my book if more if people are interested. I'm going to only concentrate on preparing for long length, uh, long focal length eclipse photography. So the basics are always this. This could be a telescope, this can be guided or unguided, but the points are the same. You always need a good solar filter, and I recommend glass, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You want to aim for an effective focal length that's eight, 600 to 800 millimeters. You have to check your camera tripods if you're not using some kind of equatorial mount to make sure you can point to the height, the altitude of the eclipse for your observing area, which in Texas can be as high as 69 degrees. A lot of regular camera tripods will not get that high. You have to have a sturdy tripod. You have to have a remote shutter release. You're gonna tape down your zoom uh, to the zoom that you wanna use for the eclipse to get to this effective focal length. And you're gonna tape down your focus once you focus on the full disc, but you might refocus in between during the eclipse and you will tape it down again. You either have to have an articulated LCD screen or a right angle viewfinder because it's hard to look up the camera when it's pointed 60 degrees in the sky. 
And so these are very important because I'm going to tell you, when you set up your gear, you should not be standing. You should always work eclipse photography sitting or kneeling. So here are my simplified steps to manual eclipse photography. I break it down into six steps. Choosing a filter, using the filter, uh, knowing your focal length and image scale, tricks for setting the proper exposure, how to um, image the diamond ring, bellies, beads, and chromosphere, and then how to image the corona. So the first thing is choosing a solar filter, and there's a lot. And of course, I prefer glass, and we're going to talk about that. There's only two suppliers that I know of that make glass now. Then they may sell them to Orion or Mead or something like that. But Seymour Solar and Spectrum Telescope still sells glass. Thousand Oaks Optical does not sell glass anymore. They sell their solar light film. And then there's Astro Solar Beta Film. Now, in my observatory in the backyard, I've tested the transmission behavior of different filter types, and it's actually kind of interesting. So this is spectrum analysis of uh, filters on the same day, around the same period of time, so on the same sun. And what this shows is Thousand Oaks optical glass. I have old glass when they used to sell glass. And this is a one second data acquisition of the setup I had. And look how flat through the spectrum that um, that Thousand Oaks glass is. Now, this is Thousand Oaks solar light film. And I could not even get data if I just uh, had acquisition of a second. I had to do my acquisition of three seconds just to get this graph because solar light film passes three stops less light. Then there's the old black polymer that Thousand Oaks used to sell. And you can see um, it passes a little more light, but it has a red shift. And then beta film is all over the place. It passes two and a thirds more light, stops of light. It has a big shift to the blue and it has a big shift to the red. So looking at it in real, in real images, the, all these three images across the top are taken at the same settings. So, uh, a shutter speed of uh, 200th of a second, ISO of 200, and an F10 for the telescope. And this is what I would cons consider a balanced full disk solar image through glass, meaning it's relatively bright in the middle, but preserves limb darkening because the sun has natural limb darkening. But you see at the same settings, the Thousand Oaks solar light is really too dark. It's too orange. And at the same settings, the beta film is way overexposed. So if I want to make the solar light have a reasonably yellow exposure, I have to go down to a 40th of a second and you see what happens with solar light. You get this haze from the film. The film does not have a good cutoff of the edges. And if I wanna use beta film to get a reasonably exposed um, solar disk that's balanced, I have to go up to one thousandth of a second. I have to be really, really fast. And you see at that exposure, beta film is starting to get blue. Now, film is nice because it is soft, it's pliable, and you can't break it. But again, the problem I have with solar light film is it has this haze when you get to the proper exposures. Another way to demonstrate that, this is solar light film at a 40th of a second, and you can see that haze. This is a 40th of a second with a glass filter it's way overexposed, but my point is, is there's a clean edge around glass. There's no bleed of the light. This is using beta film for the mercury transit, and mercury is right there. But the thing about beta film is it can get blue at certain exposures. And remember, I'm trying to teach people who are not going to be using Lightroom and do color editing after the eclipse. And so some say that beta film gives a cleaner ed, uh, uh, image. And Steve said that in his presentation, he didn't want to use glass. And that may, that may be true. But remember, we're taking the partial phase images with the glass. The money shots are with the filter off anyway. And Fred Espinick, who I just talked to after the annual eclipse in 2023, uses a 20-year-old Thousand Oaks glass filter for his main rig. 
And this is my glass image from 2017, not really compressed. And you can see, I mean, that is adequate exposure, focus, and definition of sunspots. So glass is fine. And it also helps you with your exposures, which we're gonna talk about later. So if you're gonna buy a glass solar filter, how do you do it? Well, you measure the front of your optics. It doesn't make, make a difference if it's a camera or a telescope. And you buy an aluminum rimmed um, solar filter that's about a half an inch larger and you pat it with felt. You don't want it to be tight. And the reason is you want it to be snug on the front of your gear but easily removable because you have to remove it in a split second, about 20 seconds or 30 seconds before C2 to start to image the diamond ring. And you don't want to jar your gear when you're getting it off. So you don't want threaded on filters and you don't want thumb screws. You want to pad your glass filter with felt to keep it snug, uh, block out any stray light, but be able to remove it um, easily. The other reason you want a little room is glass filters are like a mirror on the back side of them. So if your optics are reflecting any of the bright partial phase images to the front, they will bounce off the back of the glass filter and create a ghost image in your images. So the reason, the way you get rid of that is just angle your glass filter a tiny bit and send that ghost image down to the side of the optics. So this is the other reason to have some play in the fit of your filter. So the third step is to understand focal length and image scale. Remember, we want to try to get to work between 600 and 800 millimeters. And so cameras, full frame, I mean, cameras have an image circle in the back of the camera that's round. And when you use the old fashioned lens, lenses on an old fashioned camera, the um, the film was in the middle of that image circle and that's what gave you a rectangular picture. And with full size sensors, it's basically just replacing the film. So the full size sensor is still in the middle of that image circle. The tricky part comes when you're using a regular camera lens on a small sensor camera. In that case, the small sensor is only taking an image of a portion of the center of the image circle. And this is what causes the physical crop factor. So in Nikon cameras, it's a 1.5 crop factor. So if you're using a 200 millimeter lens, that lens is behaving as a 300 millimeter lens. But the tricky thing is, is if you buy a kit that is a small sensor kit, like a Nikon DX kit, where the lens and the camera are both um, labeled DX, they still have a 1.5 crop factor, even though the lens is gonna print the focal length millimeters on it to be accurate. Because the engineers always want the focal length to be the millimeter measurement from the optical center of the lens to the focal plane. They don't wanna monkey around with that. So they engineer the camera for everything to be smaller. So it still has a 1.5 uh, crop factor. So a 200 millimeter DX lens on a DX camera is still gonna behave as a 300 millimeter lens. And this is why it's important. You don't wanna shoot at 200 millimeters because your Corona will be so small you won't be able to appreciate it. And you don't wanna shoot at 1500 millimeters because you're kind of cut off coronal filaments. So again, the sweet spot is gonna be 500, 600 to 800 millimeters. Another way to look at it is this way. You can count solar diameters uh, to the sides and the, on the top and the bottom of your images. This is 905 millimeters. So you see I have about one and a half solar diameters on each side and almost one on the top of the and the bottom. This is 750 millimeters. And you see now I have about two and a quarter solar diameters on each side and about one and a half on top. To image the sun with the new sensors we have nowadays, you want to have this room or even a little bit more. So again, 600 to 800 millimeters is what you're aiming for. 
So to understand crop factor, a lot of people in their closets at home will have one of these 70 to 300 millimeter um, Sigma lenses. And if they put that on a 2X converter and they have a 1.5 crop factor, they could be working at 900 millimeters, but we don't want them to work at 900 millimeters. We want them to decrease this zoom to maybe 250 or even 200. So when they do the math, the 2X converter and the 1.5 crop factor, they're working at 750 millimeters or 600 millimeters with this system. And the same thing works with telescopes. If you have a crop factor camera on a telescope, you're going to get the crop factor. Now, if you're using a tripod, a regular camera tripod for this eclipse, not only do you have to worry about that it can get to the altitude, different camera tripods have their camera heads angling different ways. I have a number of them, and my tripods have different camera head angles. So you need a tripod for this eclipse that angles this way. Because for Northern Hemisphere eclipses that are after the point of greatest eclipse, so they're a setting eclipse, to follow the ecliptic, you have to be able to angle this way. Remember, here's the red dot. That's where the red dot is in Arkansas. That's where the red dot is in Maine. But at the coast of Mexico, when it's on the other side of the point of greatest eclipse, it's pointing that way. So you're worried about the pitch of the sun for your ecliptic because you want to move your sensor to be 90 degrees to north so that the solar equator is in line with, the, um, with your sensor. But remember, if you're guiding or not, you are only worried about your three hour time slot in the ecliptic. And for that matter, if you're not guiding in terms of rotating your camera, you're only really worried about six or seven or eight minutes at the time just before C2 and just before C3, because that's when it matters to have your solar image lined up. So step four is exposure. Now, I don't think a new eclipse photographer, somebody who's doing it for the first time, gets a lot of help from the eclipse exposure guides that are printed out there. They're kind of overwhelming. And the stop charts that are out there are not very helpful either because the technique that I use requires easily counting stops. So I've made up new custom stop charts uh, that Molly has the PDF so you can download these that do not try to overlap the stops. They're columns of stops so you can count full stops count half stops and count third stops. Because with my technique, it's very important to count third stops. And I want partial stops listed in an order that I can easily count them as I change one parameter up and down to know the equivalent exposure. And again, there's a PDF of this you can download. So here's the big trick. This is my big trick for eclipse photography with my experience from imaging the eclipses in the past. The plan is to go out on a day and take, uh, you're, you're going to have a fixed f-stop and you're going to choose an ISO of maybe 200 and then take a range of shutter speeds of the full solar disk and then look at them on your computer. What you're looking for is a shutter speed that gives a nice balanced yellow disc image. So a little bright in the center, but not enough to wash out your sunspots. And you have to preserve limb darkening because the sun has natural limb darkening. So these two would be great. This one's a little light, but it would be okay. This one's a little darker, but it would be okay. And this is what you want to do because this is important information about the light gathering behavior of your gear. And here's why. And this is from my experiencing, experience imaging solar eclipses. I know that if you have exposed your gear for a balanced full solar disk image, that that shutter speed that you're using there will later be the shutter speed that will expose inner and inner mid corona. So this always works with a glass filter for your gear, and I don't care what gear you have, if you have a balanced full disk image, 
when you take an image without the solar filter on, you're going to be at a setting that is going to image mid inner to inner mid corona. So it's really important information to know about your gear, especially if you've never imaged an eclipse before. But you're not imaging corona yet, though. There's two steps in between that you have to deal with with exposure. And one of them is imaging the last crescent or a couple of crescents, because these emit less light than the early partial phases. So you have to remember to increase your shutter speed about a third of a stop for the last one or two crescents, depending on what your interval is gonna be. So slow your shutter speed. And then the other trick for doing this manually is immediately after you take this shot. And the way I teach to take the partial phases, you'll take this two minutes before C2. Immediately after taking this shot, you have to change your shutter speed to the speed you will use for the diamond ring because the next thing you're going to be imaging is the diamond ring. Well, how do you calculate that based on what I've taught you? Again, from my experience, it all comes down to understanding your properly exposed full disk image because your properly exposed full disk image is going to expose for mid corona. But I know from my experience that if you go two to two and a third stop shutter speeds faster than this yellow picture here, you will be at a good shutter speed to enter diamond ring belly speeds into chromosphere. Now, depending on what kind of diamond ring you have or want, you might make some adjustments to this. If you want a really brilliant diamond ring like this, you might just go down one and two third shutter speeds or go up one or two third shutter speeds. If you want a really tight diamond ring, you wanna be at two stops slower or two and a third stops slower. The other way to make up for this is to start imaging sooner, and that has to do with timing. So when my app says remove your solar filter, um, you start, you remove your solar filter and you just start taking pictures as quickly as you can. All this sequence of late diamond ring into the last Bailey's beads happened over about nine or 10 seconds. So you have to take images as fast as your camera will buffer and you worry about them later. Then you'll catch the last Bailey's beads and then you'll get a couple of pictures of Promosphere and then you're into totality. So now totality is easy. All the people who stress about what exposure they're gonna use for totality don't have to worry about it anymore because you've just entered totality at this fast shutter speed that you decided on. And now it's just a matter of bracketing up to one second, two seconds, or three or four seconds if you're guiding by just changing your camera shutter speed manually two thirds of a stop at a time. I have found with Corona imaging that you can't tell the difference between one third of a stop. So it's not worth the time doing that. Skip two thirds of a stop, let your camera vibration settle down and take an image. And then immediately after your last Corona image, you have to remember to change your shutter speed back to the shutter speed that you wanna use for Bailey's beads and diamond ring. Because if you go into C2 set at two seconds or three seconds on your camera, by the time you realize your problem, you're gonna miss all of Bailey's beads and most of the diamond ring. So if you do this technique, which only takes about a little over a minute to do, even doing it manually, you will have a nice set of corona images to work with later. Now, if you're not guiding, there are some rules about the longest shutter speed you can use because of the rotation of the earth. And Fred Espinick publishes um, a formula, which is 340 divided by the focal length. So this is my first corona image ever in 2001. And the, I was using a thousand millimeters back then on slide film for my focal length. And so the formula would say that 340 divided by a thousand me meant that I can only get away with a third of a second exposure, but this was a half a second and I got away with it. So I think you can get a, away with a little bit more than the formula if you're not guiding. 
And so the goal is to have a set of bracketed corona images so that you can learn how to do high dynamic range image processing and be able to balance the dynamic range between the inner corona and the outer filaments of the corona. So this is an HDR of 17. And, you know, my work is not as good as others. I'm not that patient with this. So I only use four images to do it. This is 2019. Again, four images, not a lot of processing. You can see there's a little moon glow in here that you can add later from your longest exposure. And then at C3, um, you're just doing the same thing that you did at C2. You've set your shutter speed to the fast speed. Uh, about 10 seconds before C3, you start taking pictures as fast as your camera will buffer. You're looking at the eclipse in the sky as it's happening. You're not looking at your camera. You're just clicking your shutter. You're worried about what you got later. You take pictures for about 20 seconds after C3. And then you stop and you put your solar filter back on and you're ready for the partial phases. So again, the diamond ring is a continuum. This is from video, but I just want to show it to you. This is third contact. This is the diamond ring at 12 seconds. This is the diamond ring at 35 seconds after C3, and you can see it's blown out. And this is 45 seconds. So you have to remember that the diamond ring is just the peaking out of the photosphere again. So you can image this for a long time. Uh, you won't hurt your camera. They'll be blown out at the end, but you just don't use those. So if you have a good day, you'll have this entire sequence of the partial phases, diamond ring, belly speeds, corona, Bailey's beads, diamond ring, and the partial phases again. Or if you're setting up a sequence, you can have something like this. So how is the manual way that you can time a sequence? Let's talk about that. Most people think about using an intervalometer. Certainly most photographers will think about setting up an intervalometer to automatically take their exposures for the partial phases. And that's fine. They can pick the time they want the interval to be. They have to shut off the intervalometer at, at totality. They have to remember to remove their solar filters. They have to change their shutter speeds. And then after, they have to restart the intervalometer. And that's all fine. But have, have you guys ever thought about the fact that the duration between C1 and C2 is almost never the same duration as the time between C3 and C4. It's only at the point of greatest eclipse or close to the point of greatest eclipse that it can even be close. But for the most times, it's very different. And if you're further along the path, it gets very different. So for instance, in April, for the April 8th eclipse, if you're imaging on the border of Texas, C3 to C4 has a longer duration than C2 a C1 to C2 by 131 seconds. But if you're imaging in Maine, C, um, C1 to C2 is longer than C3 to C4 by 251 seconds. So if you were using an intervalometer um, set on four minute intervals, you would get an additional image before totality versus what you got after totality. In 2019, when I saw this setting eclipse on the end of the path, these disparities get even larger. For my eclipse, the duration between C1, uh, C1 and C2 and C3 and C4 was nine minutes difference. Now this set behind the mountain, so it didn't make a difference. But if you were using four minute intervals on an intervalometer, you would have had two additional images between C1 and C2 than you would have between C3 and C4. So the way I solve the problem doing it manually is I don't set the time of the intervals. I set the percentage of the crescent phase. So the way I do it is I take the time duration between C1 and C2 and I divide it out to make 10 images. But I also subtract two minutes. I subtract four minutes. So I take my first image two minutes after C1. So you can see a little bite coming out of the sun and two minutes before C2 so I can get ready for totality. And I calculate those clock times to take 10 images. Now in 2002, I did it all manually and it's a total pain in the butt. 
you have to get the seconds of time between C1 and C2, divide it all out in seconds, and then make that second computation be minutes and seconds, and then add the minutes and seconds to the clock times. So you have clock times that you can take these images at to get a nice balanced sequence. In 2002, I took my first image at right at first contact, and, it, and I took my last image two minutes before second contact. Now I do two minutes after first contact. But the beauty of one of the portions of my app is I invented something called PISC, which is Partial Phase Image Sequence calculator. calculator. My app takes the four contact times and does all the math for you and generates the clock times. So once you have geolocated and you know your four contact times, it spits out the 10 clock times that you should take an image to get a perfectly balanced set of partial phase sequences before and after totality. And remember, this is based, you're getting equal percentage of crescents, not equal duration of time between the crescents. That's what's going to vary. And then I have a PDF worksheet that you can download from my website. It's blank and you can write in all your times. It also has areas to write in notes about when you wanna focus or when you wanna turn on another camera or whatever reminders you want. And also the PISC times automatically update if you move to a new position. So if you move to a new position four hours before the eclipse and you re-geolocate, you'll get a new set of partial image times to use. Let's talk about imaging the planets during this eclipse on the ecliptic. There's going to be seven planets on the ecliptic during this eclipse, but most of them are going to be too dim to worry about. But Venus and Jupiter are going to be bright and spectacular. Mars and Saturn will be dim and low. So you can frame Venus during this eclipse really nicely. It's going to be almost uh, a minus four magnitude. Um, it's separated by about 15 degrees in the sky, so you can frame it with a 100 millimeter lens. Um, Jupiter will be fun to frame also. It's um, separated by 29 degrees on the ecliptic, um, so you can frame it with about a 50 millimeter lens. You can get all of them th together with about a 40 millimeter lens, but of course they would be very small. But you can frame these planet shots. I've done it. We're going to talk about it in a minute. The other thing is this comet 12P Pons Brooks is going to be in the sky during this eclipse. And there's a lot of buzz about this. So it's going to be about 24 degrees from totality and about six degrees from Jupiter. Right now it's predicted to be magnitude five, but there's people are predicting it could get brighter up to magnitude 3.5. That's the Magnitude 5 is dim for this portion of the sky during an eclipse. Because remember, eclipse is not like a nighttime sky. It's dark right around the corona, but then it starts to get gray and lighter gray pretty quickly. So this, this comet, it's not going to be lo located in really dark uh, conditions, but it might be worth trying to see with binoculars. It'll be hard to image for a couple of reasons. So this is my experience with imaging planets during an eclipse. In 2001, Jupiter was up there. It was visible to the naked eye. It was separated by from totality by five degrees, and it was magnitude minus 1.93, so it was bright. But you see, to image it, I still had to overexpose the corona a little bit. And then in 2002, Mercury was up there. You, all basically can't see it. It was magnitude uh, minus 0.64, and I really had to overexpose the corona to image it, and you couldn't see it naked eye. So this comet at magnitude 5 is going to be tough, and if you try to image it with the corona, you will definitely have to blow out your corona. So I think I'm going to try to image it by imaging Jupiter and the comet at the same time, because I think the exposures will be more matched. Um, have you guys ever heard about trying to image the one-day moon after an eclipse? 
So I heard about this in 2002 from Bill Kramer when we were traveling in Africa. We were going to Victoria Falls. And that's the problem with eclipses and trying to image the one-day moon. You're usually traveling the day after the eclipse. I tried to image the one-day moon in 2017, but it was cloudy on the horizon. And in 2019, I was in an airport in, in Argentina. And this is what it's kind of all about. During the eclipse, the moon is moving from west to east. And after the eclipse, it, it moves off of the sun and everybody forgets about it. They're really excited about the eclipse. It's over, the moon has helped us to enjoy the day. But that poor little moon that created all the fun, he's still moving to the east at 0.5 degrees per hour. The rest of that day, all night long, and the rest of the next day. So it's a challenge to try to image it the next day because you have to have clear weather conditions two days in a row and you have to have a really, really low horizon where you're gonna to try to do it. So the trick to image the one day moon is to look at the low Western horizon and watch the sun set and mark that horizon landmark so you know where it's set and then picture the ecliptic in your mind up from that point and wait for the sky glow to diminish. I've just used an as an example, Carbondale, Illinois, for fourth contact, which is at 3 p.m. And sunset the next day is at 7.30 p.m. So the moon has had 28 and a half hours to move. So the day after the eclipse, it will be trailing the sun by 15.5 degrees and will have moved to the north of the ecliptic at the horizon about two degrees. So the goal is to know where the sun set, wait for the sun glow to decrease so you can pick up the first glimpse of the fine crescent of the first day moon. Uh, you can monitor, try to pick it up with binoculars or with a telephoto lens and try to image the very fine crescent alone or with the horizon. I've never succeeded to do it. So I don't know how long it takes for the sky glow to, dis to disappear to be able to distinguish the crescent moon. But I'm staying in Texas an extra day after the eclipse. And I already have a site pre-planned on this mountain with basically a zero degree horizon to the west to try to image uh, the first day moon. Now I'm just gonna quickly talk about my app. Um, so when you geolocate at your location, it calculates the contact times in universal time. The formula for calculating the contact times is in the app. You do not need internet service to do this. If the internet goes down or cell service goes down on eclipse day, you can still calculate your contact times. And when you load them into the timers, it converts it to the local time and the app is armed and ready to talk. Now remember, there's a one hour difference right now because we're on standard time and the eclipse is in, in daylight savings time. So that hour, you're, you're if you use the app right now and you load these times, you're gonna be an hour early in the local times, but that will correct after March 10th. Now this last year, I was actually honored to work with Fred Espinick to add another feature to my app. You know, Fred, uh, scripts all of his eclipse photography now, but he reached out to me because he wanted my app to just announce times. He didn't care about the partial phase phenomena because even though he scripts, he has chores he wants to do that he wants to be reminded to do. So I programmed something called photographer's mode and when it's enabled, it shuts off all the partial phase phenomena announcements and it replaces them with timing announcements and actually other timing announcements. So you can write down things that you wanna do as a photographer for chores. The only spoken announcements in photographer's mode is a reminder to remove solar filters, a reminder for where max eclipse is and a reminder to replace solar filters. And again, I have a PDF camera chore worksheet that you can download to write your own custom list of chores you want to do. Because this is so reliant on the audio working, there's a device sound check page which runs your phone through three important tests to make sure your audio is on and your notifications are on for eclipse day. There's a hear all announcements session, which has a compressed eclipse in it that runs over about an hour and 10 minutes. So you can hear all the announcements for the eclipse. And the big thing is this feature in the app, which is called the video practice session. 
when you click on this, it plays a four and a half minute eclipse. That's my observing position from 2017 with a fixed two minute totality in it. So you can practice all of your photography. And that's uh, the end of uh, the slide presentation of my talk. Well, that was impressive, Gordon. So, yeah, thank you. It took a little time, Gordon, but in the end, it all worked out. It's yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. About the that. demons of the internet, whatever they were, seem to yeah. have gone. Uh, Gordon, there's a question Gordon, about. Yeah. Well, uh, were, was Gordon going to uh, do a demonstration with playing the um, soundtrack? So, I don't know. If, do yeah, I know if we don't have time to do that now because I messed around um, so much at the beginning. I'm sorry. I, I, I think. I think actually we do have time because we are we're still got the audience. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, guys? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Go yeah. for it. Yeah, I mean I'd do love to do it. I, I mean I was um set up to do it. Okay. So you you guys understood what I was talking about with the exposures and how you do it. But on eclipse day, you have to go through a, a routine and you have to be um quick. And that's why I have that Eclipse practice session. So you can sit in your living room with your gear and you can go through all of this time, all, the, all of this under time pressure. So I'm gonna play that video and I'm going to go through it. Now, this is what I do on Eclipse Day. This is how I do it manually. Now this video starts at 90 seconds before C2. So you have to realize at two minutes before c2 if you're using my partial phase image times you would have taken your last partial phase image and you would have done that at um about a third of a stop slower than than what you're using for the rest of the partial phases so that's already done you're inside of two minutes and i have changed my shutter speed now i'm going to change my shutter speed right after that i'm going to use a thousand because i want to be ready for diamond ring and, and Bailey's beads, right? So I'm gonna start this um, video now. You're gonna hear background noise. So th this is my site in 2011. Are you gonna share your screen, Gordon? Uh, no, no I wanna just show the camera. Out. I wanna show me demonstrating it. It's just gonna be the audio. So you heard me say fast shutter speeds. I was reminding everybody to go up to their fast shutter speed. Look at it. Second, 60 seconds observed for shadow bands. So this is 60 seconds before C2. My app tells you to look down because remember, you're going to be looking up at the crescent, but you have to be forced to look down to the ground to the white sheets to see the shadow bands. So you have to be reminded to do that. 40 seconds, observe umbra approach. Okay, so 40 seconds. Remember, you've manually know which way the umbra is approaching. 30 seconds, hands on camera filters. Put your hand on your camera filter, get ready to pull it. You could pull it now if you wanted to. And then you're taking pictures. 20, remove camera filters. You're taking pictures as fast as your shutter will, will buffer. You're looking 15. at the eclipse. Don't look at your camera. You can watch the diamond Ten. ring and Bailey speeds. So now 10 seconds, we're going into Bailey Five, speeds. Four, three, two, one. Glasses off, glasses off. So second contact hit, and I've told you're telling everybody to take their glasses off. Observe for planets and stars. There's a reminder to observe for the planets and stars. And now you're going to start to take your corona images. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down two clicks, two-thirds of a stop, let the camera settle down, take a picture. Go down two clicks, take a picture. Go down two clicks, take a picture. Go down two clicks. Take a picture. Two clicks. Take a picture. I'm going to go up to two and a half seconds. It's going to be 17 pictures. So you're just taking bragging Max images. clips in 10 seconds. So this is only a two minute totality in this video. You'll have four minutes. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, 
So that's the midpoint. You know when you're in the middle. So you got to get the, the horizon. horizon. That's a reminder to look at the 360 degree horizon. Okay, and that's my last Corona shot. Now you heard me in the video say go back up to 2000 right now. You have to remember to go up to your fast shutter speed for um, Bailey's beads. Because if you start C3 with your camera set on two seconds, you're going to miss all of Bailey's beads. By the Third time you realize in 20 seconds. that you're at two seconds, you're going to miss it. All right, 20 second call. I'm at a thousand of a second. At 10 seconds, I'm going to start taking images. 10. All right, I'm Get taking your glasses. Images. I'm taking these as fast as I can, but I'm looking at the eclipse. I'm not Five, looking at my camera. Four, three, two, one. Glasses on. All right. Glasses on. It gets Glasses bright. On. It gets bright instantly, but you can watch the beads come out. Now you're going to start to have to use Plus your solar 10 glasses seconds. because it's going to get bright. So you use your solar glasses. Plus 15. I'm Replace still camera filter. I'm taking pictures as fast as I can. At 20 seconds or so, I'm going to put my solar filter back on. Right. Plus 25. Observe for shadow bands. You need to look down at the ground again. This is your second opportunity to see shadow bands. And you have to remember to put your shutter speed back to the speed you wanted to use for the first crescent. For me, it's 160th of a second. Plus 45, observe Umbra exit. Okay, so the app is reminding you to look at the sky in the direction of Umbra exit, so you can see the sky getting gray as it races away from you. But no, look at it, look at the horizon. Plus 60, enjoy the partial phase phenomena in reverse order. Next notification is fourth contact. So that's how it works. That's how you do it manually. And it's fun. It's exciting. I mean, I know a lot of people want to script it so they can just sit there. But then they're just worried about their computer firing. I'd rather do it manually. Boy, and that sure went by fast when you were. Uh, and, and I imagine during the eclipse, really did, yeah. seen even more just <laughs> lightning, you know. Oh, it's it's wild. The time goes so fast during totality. But that's going to be uh, the beauty of this eclipse. You know, in Texas, I'll have four minutes and 23 seconds. Um, you have to practice. You have to practice over and over again. And, and that's the beauty of that little practice session. You know, the story of that is uh, I practiced. Fred Espinick had an eclipse video out on the Internet. This is really before YouTube, but it was just out there on the Internet. And I, and I found it and downloaded it. And I used to practice in my living room to his video blaring over my TV so I could practice through the distraction of the crowd. And then when I had my first app in 2001, I used to do it and I used to have to manually enter the contact times so the app would talk to me as I was doing my practice. But every time I wanted to go through it, I had to manually enter new contact times because it wouldn't synchronize with the little um, the, with the computer clock. So the beauty of smartphones is you can start that thing over and over again. It always resyncs, even if you stop in the middle of a session. So you can just practice and practice and practice, and on Eclipse Day, it'll be very smooth. You mentioned the uh, photographer mode where it just calls out times. Uh, right. With, and I wasn't entirely clear from uh, the presentation, but is that something that you can you can custom set those times at custom times, or are they just preset? They're preset. Yeah, that's a great question. So that was one of the things, you know, Fred has asked me to do, well, asked me to do, and people have asked me to do that in the past. But you, you can't imagine how difficult it would be to have an app where users are trying to tape a custom audio announcement at a custom time. It would just be impossible mm -hmm. to work. Um, so my app has so many times that are already pre-programmed in it that we just took those time slots and we had the app just announce the time that it is. Uh, and that's plenty of announcements. And then you can write your own little cheat sheet and you'll know what to do. And we added some times in totality 
because Fred wanted the time counted down to the time before C3. So like four minutes before C3, two minutes before C3. He wanted to know how close he was getting to C3. So that's what the app does uh, when you're in photography mode. So Eric, I think you were, were there some questions that yeah. you had uh, yeah. pulled off uh, the I YouTube? Remember one, there was, is there any issues about using a focal reducer or flattener as far as reflections? I assume that's a question. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, what I tell people when I'm trying to answer questions that get emailed to me or answering questions on the forums, I basically just tell people the least amount of surfaces of glass, the better for eclipse photography. Um, and that's probably true for everything. But when you're going to potentially end and uh, introduce surfaces of glass that can cause reflections that can be a real problem with the bright partial phases. But again, I mean, you do what you need to do to get to the proper uh, working focal length, and then you test outside, you know, with your filter and you see what your images are, are looking like. Yeah, I think we all agree that a couple of us are getting prepared now and you do it over and over and over again to the point of. I don't want to say boredom, but so you don't have to think about it and yeah. can enjoy the eclipse, which is over in an instant. Yeah. yeah, and and I think Eric mentioned this at some point, but if you screw this up, watch the eclipse. That's right. Yeah, okay? that's right. Don't worry about it. Just yeah. watch the eclipse. But everything is right. If if your computer crashes, if who knows what, you forget your lens or whatever, right. Sit back, watch the eclipse. You remember that a lot longer than the picture you took. Okay, yeah, we we did have a number of questions. Um, I I asked. Yeah, I one. kind of lost track of them. Maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm back on that. Um, uh, you had a chart showing the different spectral responses and energy responses from the various types of filters, glass yeah. versus beta, et cetera. Yeah. And you specified the beta was so and so. Which of the beta films were you using? Because I I at least back when I was familiar with this stuff, they had visual and photographic right. beta films. That was uh, that was the visual, that was okay. optical density five. Okay. Um, and then uh, can you use a modern CMOS camera like a 2600 MC Pro and use image acquisition sequences in Nina? Nina? You know, that's a great question. So I'm on a lot of the forums on cloudy nights and all of those cameras are really popular now. And 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 there's a lot of guys talking about how they're gonna try to use it for the eclipse. Um, I'm sure they'll be successful. Uh, I have no way to give advice on that. I don't own those cameras. I don't do that kind of imaging. Okay. Um, now, if, Frank, you, if you have a lens, I'm sorry. If you have a lens and it has autofocus, Turn off the autofocus. Yes, yeah. that's a good point. Um, Frank wants to know: Does um, removing the glass in front of your objective affect the filter at all, or uh, the focus at all? No, no, no. Um, you know, so it's hard to focus on um, the globe of the sun. Uh, certainly, if we have sunspots, and we should, because we're going to be in a solar maximum, you focus on the on the sunspots. And then the little trick is during the partial phases, maybe two or three times, uh, try to check your focus by um, zooming in on one of the little points of the banana. So move your gear to center the point of the banana and focus on that because it's hard to focus on the limb. And sometimes it's hard to focus on sunspots. So focus on the, the little point of the banana and then recenter everything. And I would do that uh, you don't want to do it too close to totality because you don't want to mess stuff up. I think you should probably do your last focus maybe 10 or 10, 12 minutes before totality through your glass filter, and removing the glass filter will not affect that enough that you will notice anything. Okay. Thank you. Um, Toby wants to know uh, your advice about uh, 8 tenth um, or any other focal reducers or field flatteners or anything like that. You know, um, I've used field flatteners for some of my deep sky astrophotography on my rig. And, um, but I've never tried to use them for, for the sun. 
I, I don't know how they'll behave, but again, you can, you're just trying to get to the proper final focal length and do testing on, on a full solar disk image. I mean, that's really all you can do. That's the problem with eclipses. It's you can't practice. And the next big one in the United States is 2045. Yeah, well, Alan Dyer, who's been contributing various comments along the way, and he's quite accomplished in himself, right. mentions mentions that you you might have a lot of uh, lens flares and diamond rings, and I think generally we all we all know that when you got a lot of light around, it's best to have as few optical elements as can get you a sharp picture. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. The, yeah, the less surfaces of glass, the better with bright mm -hmm. solar eclipse photography. There's no question about it. Yeah, um, simple is better. I mean, that's why telescopes are better than telephoto lenses and zoom lenses. But I know a lot of people are going to use the zoom lenses that they have at home, and I have no problem right. with that. I've had good success with my Sigma uh, 500 millimeter lens. Okay. Um, oh yeah, this is a question from Alex. Hey, that's me. Um, if you're you you said several times that if you're uh guiding and if you're guiding and if you're guiding we use guiding to, to mean sensing on a, a star's position oh yeah a, you meant tracking right i meant tracking yeah motorized was, mount yeah 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 yeah, uh, um, yeah motorized mount and polar aligned i'm sorry yeah uh, that's yeah, that is okay. a mistake yeah for you guys uh, and i think this is a variation of the question you answered earlier ben bro wants to know um uh, using astro cameras um, rather than the DSLR, and the same thing applies as you said earlier, I believe. Uh, oh, you mean DSLRs that are set up for specifically for astrophotography? They have that different kind of center balance. I think he means you know you don't have shutters with shutter speeds on a typical astro cam. So it's, it's oh. in my mind, it's the same question you already answered about um, whether the whether you should use Nina or what. I mean, how do you control the exposure on a astro camera that doesn't have a shutter? Well, the good luck, dude. <laughs> well, one of the things you can do is, uh, so on Fred Espinac's website, he's got that table of uh, ISO and f-stop and what exposure time you should use for different parts of the eclipse. Yeah. What you can do is um, put, put on your solar filter and uh, look at where he's got the partial phase exposure time and then change your gain until you get an exposure that like, like it's, it's a well-exposed sun. And then that's then you can link up. All right, uh, I'm going to set this gain, and then now I can use the exposure times for this for this ISO, even though it's not really your ISO. Yeah. But you, you're you've linked it now to right. to an ISO so that you can use that table to get the exposure times and just convert to milliseconds uh, for all of the different phenomena. That's what I'm going to be doing with Nina and my 2600. <laughs> Okay, Ralph. Ralph has had the uh, you know you you mentioned if you ever wanted to take a first day moon. This yeah. is how you're going to have to do it. Why would anybody be interested in a first day moon? What's the attraction of taking a picture of it, finding it, all that stuff? Well, you know, that's a great question. And, and it has to do with the astronomy because it puts the orbit of the moon in perspective. Uh, that's what I like about it. You know, the day of the eclipse, just for non-astronomical um nomenclature the moon is before the sun and it's moving into the sun the day after the eclipse the moon is after the sun and the sun is setting and and you see the first day moon it just it gives some it gives some realism to the orbit of the moon because we kind of take the moon for granted and we never sit out there and watch the moon move across the horizon at night for three hours you know relative to some other uh you know, heavenly body or even the landscape you know what i mean so it's just it's just a fun thing to do it's, yeah. it's a nuance of eclipse photography and obviously there are people who know more about this than i do out there where are you Tariq? there you are um but uh citing the first day moon also tells you when the muslim calendar can start uh and depending on which area you live in it might be a little bit different so it gets to be it gets to be pretty interesting but it's mostly just a an interesting phenomenon to watch and to know that you've done it kind that's of thing. exactly right now i want to try to do this in the future bill kramer i talked to bill kramer about the first day moon because he's the one who mentioned to me a long time ago bill kramer has actually been in an eclipse 
where he saw the morning new moon. So he saw the crescent that was later going to be the new moon. Now, I want to do that at some point. I need to talk to him better on how you do that and what kind of horizon you need to, to see and what kind of eclipse could possibly allow you to do that. But doing the one day moon is the easier part of doing the zero day moon. Isn't totality the new moon? It is. Okay. So I don't understand what you just said. Well, so the moon had to rise on the day of the eclipse. So there can be some eclipse paths and some positions that you can be in where you see its last final crescent. It's the opposite of seeing the one day moon. It's like seeing the last oh. part of the 28 day okay. moon. Okay. Gordon, do you ever uh, go to the SEML.io site? I think I do. I, I'm a discussion. member of that. Yeah, I monitor that. I, I don't. I generally don't chime in on it because it's, there are really smart guys on that site, and they get into eclipse stuff that's really more esoteric <laughs> that, than I'm interested <laughs> in. No, no. Just to be honest. Yeah. No, and, no. Uh, you're. I've read some of the those postings. Right. They get very technical. Yeah, they uh, do. Do you um, know the moderator? That uh, Gil, I I just know of him. No, I don't know him. I'm gonna share my screen for a second. I think I am anyway. Um, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to something we don't focus on too much. But down at the bottom, uh, depending on how you set your screen up, down at the bottom of that, we've we've got a whole lot of data for you here as to other places to get information. So be sure to take advantage of it for this particular eclipse and for this particular program. Okay. Thank you. Did we get all the questions in? Uh, I think I missed, I kind of lost track of it. I had some problems with yeah. YouTube. Let's so uh, Molly, Molly I wanted to a, thank you for, for filling in there for a while. Your dancing impromptu two step. It was cool. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm finished. Back back. Are we done, Patrick? I think so. I think so. It sounds like we got all the questions. And uh, yeah. Gordon, we, I know we all really enjoyed that and appreciate you uh, sticking with it and working through those issues. And, and you know, Molly, you too. So uh, Yeah. No, I but, appreciate you guys. I was so looking forward to giving this talk. And I was just really bummed when it was giving me problems at the beginning. I think I know what the problem was, though, now, guys. I uh, was using uh, part of uh, the Windows operating system where you can go into, I think it's called ease of use and make your mouse bigger. But I think that takes processing power. Yeah. Uh, what I did was I shut that off. And when I shut that off, I was fine. I wanted to have a bigger mouse so I could use it as a pointer. Uh, but that's that was a bad move. I've never really tested that before. It's worked fine here locally for me. Uh, I wanted to make it easier to give the presentation. I, that's what caused my problems. I'll never do that again. That's well, really that good to know for, yeah. for the future as well. And PowerPoint has a um, uh, some pointing tools like a laser pointer and stuff uh, to make yeah. the cursor easier to see as well mm -hmm. for future presentations. Patrick, you want to end our session? We are running a bit long, aren't we? All right, <laughs> we are. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Gordon and uh, everybody for tuning in. Uh, don't forget, we're off next week, but we'll be back in two weeks to uh, learn about some remote imaging in Chile. So with that, uh, Tim, you can take us out whenever you're ready. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff managed to type this in just barely. <laughs> Jeff wants to know, where can we get Gordon's books? Oh, there you go. Good question to end with. Um, did you send? Yeah, me the so link? Molly, I sent you those links. Uh, just my main website has all the information about my YouTube channel, uh, the app, and the various um, and the various ways to get the book. So it's just www.solareclipsetimer.com. Yep, and that's in the that's that's the first link in the uh, in the description. All right. Perfect. And Gordon, uh, when we end the show, you know, please, if you'd like, stay with us. And yeah, sure. 
you, already... you can relive the moment. <laughs> Unlike an eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a view of uh, of uh, Gordon's website, so we can leave that up, and I guess transition out. So. Alrighty. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thanks Thank for you, sticking everybody. with us. Good night. See you in two weeks. Enjoy the Super Bowl. <laughs>